We've heard a fair amount this morning about the Tamukwa, so I'll just refresh your memory of some basic facts. They were the native people of most of North Central and Northeast Florida, also adjacent parts of Georgia. And um, the archeologists tell us that at the time of European contact, there might have been as many as 100,000 to 200,000 people living in that part of Florida. Uh, due to war and possibly disease, as Michael says, the population collapsed around 1650. Um, at the time of the Spanish departure from Florida, there were about 200 Tamukwas left, and they went with the Spanish to Havana, Cuba. Uh, their descendants are probably still alive in Florida, maybe as parts of other tribes, or possibly alive in Cuba, but there are no, uh, no longer any Tamukwa as a distinct ethnic group today. Their language is also extinct. Um, it is unclear how it might be related to other Native American languages. The language family just to the north is Muscogean. That's the family that includes Choctaw and Seminole. Um, and it's possible there might be some relationship between Tamukwa and Muscogean, but it's not yet been proven. Um, during the time of the missions that we're talking about today, there were two Franciscan priests, Francisco Pareja and Gregorio de Movia. And between them, they published, uh, I believe, seven books. So there's an arte, four catechisms, a confessional, a doctrina. Um, there may have been other materials which have not been found. Um, and these materials were published between 1612 and 1635. There are also two letters written in the language written by native speakers. Those are from later in the 17th century. And in total, there are about 2,000 pages of bilingual Tamukwa Spanish text. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is inside one of the uh, published books. Uh, the woodcut here probably comes from Mexico. Something about the clothes the people are wearing looks kind of Aztec, right? But the um, underneath here, we've got some Tamukwa words here. So um, the, to know, understand, you have to know that this guy seated, seated here is the fiscal. He's a uh, Spanish uh, religious authority. And so the text in Tamukwa at the bottom says, the fiscal orders that the lazy student be beaten. And you see this kid down here is getting beaten. This is the technique I use with my own students. <laughs> well, so this is maybe an idealized image, but as Michael said earlier, one of the uh, ways in which uh, colonization and religious conversion happened in this part of the world was you brought young students, young native students into these schools and you taught them to read and write. Spanish but also their own language. The idea here was to teach the students to read and write so that they could read um, religious material, catechisms, confessionals, and other items like this. Um, I've argued in some previous work that there are multiple dialects of the Tamukwa that are on the printed material here, and that in a lot of cases the content of the Spanish and the Tamukwa can diverge from each other. And um, I'll continue to argue today, it's unlikely that Pareja himself wrote all the things that have his name on the front of them. Um, in the talk that I'm going to give this morning, I want to talk about the dialect diversity in a little bit more detail. And I want to argue that the different dialects can help us tentatively identify several different native writers in the Tamukwa corpus. Okay. So uh, when we talk about Tamukwa dialects, one of the first things we'll, people will uh, ask is, what are the names of these dialects? This is sort of a difficult question. So in Pareja's Arte, he talks a little bit about some dia diagnostic differences between different kinds of dialects of Tamukwa. So the primary um, examples that he gives are differences between Mokama, uh, which is the dialect of the coast, uh, Tamukwa, which was originally the western dialect, and Potano, which was another western dialect. There are also a few examples in the Arte of the dialects called Eufera and Agua Salada. The eastern dialect is Mokama. Mokama just means salt water, basically. So it means coastal, more or less. And the few examples that are given from Agua Salada are nearly identical. And Pareja says that he's writing in the Mokama dialect. 
The two main Western dialects are Tamuqua and Potano, and the two letters that I mentioned, which are written in the mid-17th century, may be in the Potano dialect. They seem pretty different from the earlier printed religious materials. Unfortunately, the dialects that Pareja names, they don't um, line up very well with the kind of dialect variation I see in the writing. And it's partly because Pareja only gives about 20 words that are supposed to be different between these different dialects. They're not very common words mostly, so they don't show up with enough frequency to use those words to diagnose the different dialects. How, nevertheless, there are other parts of the uh, language used in these documents that are systematically different from each other. So let's talk about uh, the various things that have Pareja's name on the front. So there are two 1612 documents. They're both catechisms, catechisms spelled differently uh, in the two 1612 documents. There's a 1613 book called the Confessionario. Then there's a 1614 arte, and an arte is a kind of attempt to write a grammar of this language in the same way you would have a grammar of Latin. Then there's a gap of about 13 years, and then there are two more books, another two catechisms. Uh, one is the, the 1627a catechismo, the other is catechismo e examen. And I'm just going to briefly show you a little bit of what these uh, documents look like. So this is the first 1612 catechism, and here's the second one. Um, and you can see, just comparing them, that on the cover page we see Pareja's name here and also here. Right? Okay. This is the 1613 Confessionario. And the Arte is a bit strange, uh, a little different from the others, in that this book was not actually printed uh, in the sense that it was typeset. And there were some pages that were uh, typeset and apparently sent to Pareja for correction or to someone for correction. Because when we look at it, we can see some odd mix of typeset words, but also handwritten additions here. Um, and then the printed version sort of stops halfway through, and then it's all handwritten after that. It's a strange thing. This is the thing that I think is probably most likely to be written by Pareja himself, because it's a, a, a mix of Spanish and Tamuqua material. It uses Latinate grammatical terms uh, that he probably learned in his uh, training in Spain. Uh, the two other documents are this Catechismo here, 1627, and this one. Okay, so let's look at some pages from uh, various of these. This is from the Confessionario. So you can see the way this is laid out is that there are two columns here. There's uh, Spanish on the left and Tamuqua on the right. So for example, this first question is, did you confess on the last Lent? And then we can see the same question over here in Tamuqua. The Spanish word for Lent is Quaresma. We can see Quaresma here as well in Tamuqua. So if we're trying to figure out the language, you can try to match up the Spanish and the Tamuqua word for word or part by part and try to figure out what do all the different parts of Tamuqua mean? What are the words of Tamuqua? This page is really pretty easy. Um, so this is often where people start, but a lot of the pages are a little harder. So you can also get things with this long paragraph in Spanish here, followed by another long paragraph in Tamuqua. Um, what's particularly challenging is that often the, let's say the Tamuqua may be twice as long as the Spanish or half as long as the Spanish, and uh, detailed examination seems to show they often say slightly different things. One expands on something. The Spanish often says, et cetera. And, <laughs> yeah, so, okay. so there's no dictionary for this language, or at least no contemporary dictionary. Um, in this grammatical sketch, the Arte, there are about 400 words that are given Spanish glosses, but the text contain at least 2,000. Actually, uh, I believe the current dictionary that we're working on at University of Florida has about 2,300 words of Tamuqua right now. Um, for the ones that are not explicitly given a definition in the Arte, we have to work out what the word means by looking at all the places that it's used. And so from their context, we can deduce the meanings. We've been building a large electronic database of Tamuqua, 
And right now we have 73,000 words in the database uh, composed of these various things. Um, eventually we are working for a database that has all of this. There's a team of students at UF working with me on this. Um, I have uh, some very uh, kind undergraduates who are transcribing documents and a graduate student who's sort of supervising and correcting their transcriptions. Once we have it all transcribed, we can search through it and look for patterns in the data. So um, advantages of looking at the language this way, this grammar is very hard to understand. Uh, many of the words or affixes that show up in the arte are rare in the text or sometimes non-existent. There are also lots of words that show up in the text that are not even mentioned in the arte. Um, it gives us a much more representative view of the Tamuqua language, but it has not until now been seriously studied. And the text also allow us to identify variation between different parts of the text. Okay. So let me try to begin my argument for why Pareja was not the sole author of all these materials. So we have to think a little bit, what does it mean to be the author of something like this? Well, if you think back to that confessional, there's the Spanish on the left, the Tamuqua on the right. So Pareja didn't write the Spanish, right? Because that's a standard confessional that comes from Spain. All the questions are sort of standard questions. So he didn't write that part. What about the Tamuqua part of it? Did he know Tamuqua well enough to translate all of this by himself, just sitting alone in his cabin? Probably not. So we can think of a few possibilities. Maybe the first one is he spoke it well enough, he just did it all by himself. Maybe not so likely. Or he worked with bilingual converts. They translated the Spanish and then he wrote down what they said. That's the second option. Third is there's some literate, trusted Tamuco convert who writes the translation. Pareja is there and supervising in some way. And then the last one, which is the one that I want to try to argue for today, is that there's uh, various Tamuqua converts who have been assigned different portions of this to translate. And then uh, Pareja collects all of these pages from different native translators, puts them together, and sends them off to be printed. Uh, I should have mentioned when we were looking at these books together that a very interesting fact is these books are printed in Mexico. So there was not a printing press in colonial Florida, at, at that time at least. And um, so what the process of printing these would have be meant collecting all the handwritten pages, putting them on a ship, the ship goes to Mexico, they're printed in Mexico City, and then they come back here by ship to be distributed to local Indians. So in this last scenario where we're collecting the pages and sending them off to be printed, that's more like what we would call an editor today, right? So let me give you a little archaeological analogy, just because I know a lot of you are archaeologists or interested in archaeologists. So suppose we, we know that there are these three plots of land. They're all identified as belonging to some owner at a, about the same time. And we want to know, did this owner, did he live and work on all of these places? Or did he own them, but some of them were inhabited by other people, his tenants or his workers? So one way we might approach that is we might look at the distribution of artifacts of the three sites to see how similar they are. So here's the linguistic analogy. Think of the areas to be surveyed as sections of the text, right? Think of the artifacts as a particular choices of words and their spellings. And think of the distribution of the wording spelling choices as signatures of particular writers in the text. So uh, I'm going to talk today about a couple of items that I've identified as being variable in the text and talk a little bit about the pattern in which we see their variation. One important thing to understand for this is that at the time Tamuka was being written around 1612, or I guess earlier since we have to think it being written a couple of years before it was sent off to Mexico to be printed, right? So we think of when it was being uh, first written, that's only maybe 10 years after the missions are established. The language did not have any writing system prior to that. There weren't any strict spelling rules. So I think every person sort of wrote the language as it sounded to them. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of variation in how people spelled things. And also there was some lexical variation, by which I mean different people use different words for the same thing. 
and I'm gonna argue this suggests different uh, native authors. So these are the six things whose variation I wanna talk about today. One is there's a plural suffix, which is spelled either bow or buo. Um, there's a word that means for, which is spelled either beta or bueta. There's an irrealis. Irrealis is sort of like the future. It refers to things that have not yet happened or did not happen perhaps in the past, like imaginary or future things, spelled either habe, habue, or hawe. The word for thing is spelled either hachibono or hachibueno. And if you're keeping track, a lot of these are variations between B and BW, but before different kinds of vowels. There are different frequencies of variation before different vowels. Then the last two are lexical choices. So if you look at the word for heaven in the text, there are three different possibilities. Some texts call it numa abo, some call it nalimo, and some call it nalimo abo. Abo means up, but the other part, nalimo or numa, is um, distinctive for different dialects. And finally, this is sort of a minor one, but the word name is spelled visa with a B in some documents and visa with a V in other documents. So let me talk about the first one of these, the plural suffix. Um, and also I want to say just because I don't want to bore you all and we only have a limited amount of time, I'm not going to try to talk about all of these documents. I'm just going to talk about three of them. I'm going to talk about the 1612a Catechismo, the Confessionario from 1613, and the Arte from 1614. And um, I've argued in other places that the 1613 Confessionario is internally divergent. There's a middle section of the Confessionario written in a different dialect of Temuqua from the material around it. And that's the part that's generally called the superstitions portion of the document. So. Uh, just looking at these three documents, the first thing we want to look at is the bow buo variation. So there's this plural morpheme bow, and um, I've, I'm arguing that some of the speakers of Tamuqua pronounced it bow, and others pronounced it, pronounced it buo. We can see an example of it uh, in this Tamuqua phrase here, uh, something like Angeli Niha Hoto Botema, which means our guardian angel. So that means literally the one who guards us. Us is plural, right? So the verb has a bow suffix showing that the object of the verb is plural. Notice in this example it's spelled bow, B-O. But in other cases, we see it's spelled B-U-O. So here's a question, how many things do we ask for in the Our Father? And the last word is we ask. And here we've got we ask, but here the plural part is spelled B-U-O. So what's up? Sometimes B-O, sometimes B-U-O. So what I did is for uh, groups of about 20 folia in the 1612a catechism and in the confessionario, we went through and counted the number of bow variants and the number of buo variants. So the bow is the red here and the buo <laughs> is the yellow. And what we can see is when we look at the 1612 catechism, we get this fairly even distribution of the two variants. There's a little bit of variation, but the numbers are not very high. This probably doesn't mean anything. I would say there's a pretty consistent even distribution of the two. But there's a wildly different pattern in the confessionario. You notice that there are long portions where it's entirely bow. So there's this initial portion. There's a middle portion here that's all bow. Then at the end, it's all bow again for another 50 folia or something. This middle portion right here, however, switches into a dialect that looks rather like this dialect. Um, and so if we, uh, returning to the idea of internal divergency in the con confessionario, the suggestion that I've made for what's going on with this pattern here is that the confessionario has multiple native authors, that there's one native author probably for this part, and maybe the same author for this part, and a different author for this part in the middle. Okay. There is this anomalous one example here. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. If that little part is also divergent from the rest, or if that's just one example and maybe it's not statistically significant. Okay. So that's two of these corpora, the 1612a and the confessionario. If we look at the bigger picture of four 
corpora, what we see is that um, the use of, if you use almost nothing but bow, that's a fairly distinctive pattern. And I won't run a lot of complicated statistics for you today, but I just want to say that for each of these variations, I'm looking for something that is unusual that marks this text as different from the other text. So the thing that is different in some of these texts is some of them use almost nothing but bow. And most of the confessionario and the arte have that pattern, but the catechism and the superstitions portion have a different pattern. Okay. Um, it's difficult really for us to construct a sensible scenario in which Pereja wrote all four of these things, but went back and forth in his spelling. So in the 1612, he sort of evenly distributed them. 1613 decided not to do that, except for the middle of it where he decided to do it. Then he decided to go back to the, to the previous pattern for the remainder of the book. And in the Arte, he decided only to write Bo. I think much more likely is that uh, uh, Pareja wrote the Arte. The three other works are written by different native authors using different spelling systems. Um, is it possible that, looking back, is it possible that Pareja wrote this and this, so the Arte and the Confessionario? Well, for this particular thing, they look alike, but if we look at the next variant, we can see that they look different. So here we want to look at the uh, variants of the way for spelling the word for. So um, that's spelled either beta or bueta. And we can see that in the arte, he always spells it beta, B-E-T-A. But in none of the other texts do we see that pattern. So that the arte is the uh, standout from the other text for this variation. Um, I'll go through a couple of others of these. Please don't fall asleep while I'm doing it. It is linguistics. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but we won't, we won't spend too long on it. Okay, so this is the irrealisis, is the either future or imaginary event. And um, that is spelled three ways in the text, either habe, habue, or hawe. And this middle portion here, the sort of yellowish one, that's the habue variant. That's very rare in any text ex except the 1612. So no other text in the corpus has more than 2% of this. And we can see that this uh, text here, the 1612 Catechism, is quite different in its spelling of this suffix relative to all the others. Uh, here's our Hachibono and Hachibueno. So it's sort of usual in most of the texts for the two to alternate as they do in the Confessionario plus the superstitions portion. But unusually, the 1612 Catechism always spells it Hachibueno, and the Arte also always spells it Hachibono. So completely different spellings between the 1612 and the 1614. Uh, we're almost at the end, so a couple of different words for heaven. So a very unusual one is Nali Mo Abo, only used in 1612 and not used at almost at all in any other spelling, any other text. And um, you might say, well, for uh, a Catholic idea like heaven, maybe early on in 1612 they thought, let's call it Nalimo Abo, and then later they decided, oh, that's not so good, maybe that has some pagan connotation, let's change it to Numa Abo, maybe that's the new term. But if we look at the bigger picture of seven documents, we can see that this Nali Moabo is used in 1612, then there's this long period where it's not used, and then the late documents go back to using it again. So I think that the dialect used in these later documents looks pretty much like the dialect used in the earliest document, but not like these ones in the middle. And finally, uh, these words for uh, name, the spelling of uh, Bisa, B-I-S-A for name is only found in the superstitions part. Or let me back, I said that incorrectly. In the superstitions, we only get the spelling Bisa, whereas in all of the other texts, they alternate with each other. Uh, the Arte, for some reason, I have not found any examples of it, but at least this one is different from these other two for this thing. So if we just look at these distinctive properties compared with each other, so we've got the Nalimo property, the Bo property, the Beta property, 
the Habue property, Hachibono, and Bisa. And so here we've got our text, the 1612, the Catechism, the 1613 Confessionario, the superstitions portion of the Confessionario, and the Arte. You can see actually that none of these four actually seem to have the same dialect pattern. And so I've tentatively identified four authors here that I'm calling A, O, S, and P. So P is pareja, but who is A? We don't know. Who is O? We don't know. Who is S? We don't know. We can probably guess something about these authors. So um, as Michael said in his presentation, the primary students in these classes are going to be uh, teenagers, let's say. They're good at languages. They were typically brought as kids. Um, by the time that these documents were being composed in manuscript form, probably uh, the kids would have been in the schools maybe for eight years, 10 years, something like that. If you started school at six or seven, you might be 16, 17. So I would say that these are the writing styles of individual teenage Tamukwa converts, probably. Um, so in terms of this, Pareja must have written the Arte, I think, because it uses Latin, it uses grammatical terminology. Uh, the Arte, interestingly, is uncharacteristically uniform. So in the same way that if you are not a native speaker of a language, you don't tend to use the same variation. I'll give you an example. Native English speakers, they say walking and walkin, alternating those two in some sort of natural pattern. If you learn English as a second language, you probably only say walking or you say walkin, but you don't alternate them in the same native way. So second language learners tend to have more uniform grammar and spelling than native speakers do. So the arte here is uncharacteristically uniform in the way you might expect from a second language learner. Whereas the other texts are very variable in a way that's richly natural for first language writers. Um, so how many authors? I've argued for S, uh, P, S, O, and A. And just to end this up, I want to say a little bit about Christianity and literacy for the Tamuquas. So as we said, the Spanish intention in translating these documents in Tamuqua was to have native people read them in their own language. So Spanish mission education included training Tamuquas to read and write. Many other Tamuqua literacy materials existed, we believe, spellers, reading books. Some of them are mentioned in letters, but these have been lost. We know that Tamuqua converts learned to recite the catechism, um, prayers, uh, the Our Father, the Credo, and so on in Tamuqua. So Pareja arrived in the Tamuqua area around 1595. The short catechism, confessionario were begun maybe 10 years or more after this. The students in the schools are good candidates for the unnamed authors of these texts. Uh, we know that native people wrote letters to each other and to the Spanish authorities in the later part of the 17th century. Um, and um, just to re recap my final argument then, there are at least two Tamuqua co-authors in the Confessionario, shown by their different dialects. I call them O and S. The primary author of the catechism, A, is different from O and S. Although Pareja is listed as author of all of these, the different language and the different content in the documents raises a number of issues that make it very unlikely he wrote the Tamuqua uh, portions. So I want to argue today that, the text are not, that these texts are not necessarily the work of Pareja, but are instead the work of unnamed Tamuqua co-authors and whose work was made possible by literacy among Tamuqua uh, Christian converts in the 17th century. So in conclusion, Tamuqua are a vanished people. We can gain insight into their perspectives from Tamuqua authors 400 years ago. I should have also said these texts are the oldest writings in a Native American language of North America outside Mexico. And the uh, unnamed authors of these texts are the earliest Native writers in this country. Thank you. Yes.
Yeah, so the question is, is it possible that the handwritten manuscripts that were used by the printer still exist somewhere, or were they destroyed? I guess I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone know? They haven't been found. I don't know what, maybe someone who studies the history of printing would know if printers typically kept manuscripts or typically destroyed them. My guess is Probably not, yeah. Uh, yes? Is there a possibility that Pereja, or anyone else for that matter, actually dictated the language and other people transcribed it or printed it, which would account for differences in spelling? Or well, it, it wouldn't explain the difference between the different words for heaven, for example. Okay. Yeah, about the different words for heaven? Yeah. Okay. Um, which one did Perea use in the Arte? Did he use Numa or Narimo? He used uh, Numa in so the Arte. Might he have been choosing to use Numa because that sounds like a word that has something to do with heaven in Spanish? Numinus, Numina. Well, or Latin, actually, let's be more correct, yeah. in Latin. And not trying, I mean, maybe we're talking yeah. about, like, Narimo was what the Tamuka might have called, right. where their afterworld, their place you go. And he's like, okay, we need to change the name to something yeah. that's more Well, you know, what's, what's funny about this is that you could imagine maybe wholesale deciding to change it from one thing to another, maybe starting with Numa and switching to Nalimo. What is very weird is the way in which they alternate in the same text. Okay. So if you go from page to page, sometimes it's called Nalimo and sometimes Numa, but the proportion is different in different texts. So some texts sort of go between Numa and Numa Abo, and uh, others only use, say, and also include Nalimo, others exclude Nalimo altogether. It's a very okay. odd pattern. You, yeah. you don't have a lot to go with, so I guess, I mean, there's not that many. All I, all I, I don't know, let me put it this way, I don't know why. But I, knew that, I do know that the pattern of variation is not consistent with a single person writing all of that, I think. Could, yeah. Along those same lines, could it be they had more than one word for heaven? Just it, as Eskimos have a lot of words for snow and we just say snow. They could have them, but let's suppose that there are three different words that mean heaven. It's very peculiar that the writer of the 1612 Catechism decides to use all three. But in 1613, only two of them are used. And then the third word for heaven reappears in the 1627 work. And that in the arte, only one of them is used, right? So this is the part that is weird. I, I prefer to think of it a little bit more as a dialect difference, um, that either in one dialect, the two terms are synonymous, and maybe in the other dialect, only one of the terms is used, or something along those lines. Yeah, Jerry. Model, model. Does, is that referring to standardized Spanish questions that are in it, or? Um, I believe it's the Arte that says it's based on a, a grammar of Nahuatl, right? Uh, I, I thought, I'm not sure, I have to, but I thought the confessional said in the Nahuatl, so, some, something like that. Uh -huh. And I just wondered if that's. And I, th I think I saw it in some yeah. other confessional of a different language from yeah. Mexico. So, I'm, I'm, so that, the, in other words, those questions that they ask have, uh, I'm trying to think of one that's a good, but. Yeah, did you confess last Lent, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, probably in all of this thing. I think there is sort of a uniform formula for con composing a native language uh, confessional or catechism, although it is surprising that we have, um, four catechisms, and the composition of the questions is notably different between them. But you can sort of think as a, sort of a standard menu that you can draw from particular things to emphasize in particular ones. One of them is called a, uh, by the way, yes, please. I, I will mention one of the things that's called a catechism is not in any traditional way a catechism. It's a long explanation of the creation of the world according to Genesis. Now, the translations the, that they had between the Spanish and the Tamuqua languages, are they exactly linear? Like, can you, could, can you point to that word in Spanish and point to that word in Tamuqua? Or are, is the grammar so different that you might have to piece it together a little bit? 
Yeah, what you have to do is you have to work out a, an idea of the way Tamuqua grammar works. And often the Spanish and the Tamuqua are paraphrases of each other in some way. So they say approximately the same thing, but express it in different ways. I don't know if that answers exactly, right? Um, I, was, I was more like asking if uh, the Spanish and Tamuqua grammar was similar enough no. that it's almost linear. No, there's, there's very little similarity between Spanish and Tamuqua grammar. Tamuqua grammar is pretty similar to the grammar of Choctaw or Creek um, in terms that it is a language with very long words. It has lots of prefixes, a verb stem, and then lots of suffixes. So, um, you know, Tamuqua words are about that long, and they often correspond to five or six different words of Spanish. So you have to know the meaning of each part in Tamuqua and the rules for putting them together then you look at a long Tamuqua word, you take each part, you think of what it means and its rules, and then you reconstruct what the Tamuqua means based on that. Most of the time, the result you get corresponds pretty roughly to what the Spanish says, but there are some uh, notable differences as well, occasionally. Thank you. Sure. Yes. My only comments were, um, that heaven is in Spanish is cielo and in Latin is, I don't know how to say it, Latin ciolo. And there's really, you know, I was trying to, in, in relation to what he was saying, I was yes. trying to figure were, there, were they kind of extrapolating using their own, uh, using, you know, Spaniards using their own language and maybe making up words, but you had yeah. said that it's numilo, nalimo abo, meaning they already knew that abo meant up. Abo definitely means up. So nalimo right? abo is, is the heaven, the word maybe they used for heaven, more exact in the Tamukan uh, language. I think that, yeah, nalimo or numa, in my view, probably are some pre-existing Tamukwa words referring to some place where the dead live, maybe, or right. some other place, or it, they seem to have some locational uh, right. meaning already in a way that's close enough that the Catholics decided to use these as the translations for heaven. In the same way, you know, they had to find ways to translate sin and confession and all these sort of things using native terms that mean things like doing bad or washing or curing. And then uh, just one other question I have is the, um, when you talked about the, the catechism or the confessionals, like I'm, because I'm Catholic, I'm familiar yes. with the Boston Catechism, is there you know, you talked at long explanation of the world according to Genesis. Is that what the content primarily was of, um, or was it more like mm -hmm. the Boston Catechism type concept? Right, so these uh, catechisms, they typically run through a number of different things. They'll run through, for example, the um, seven deadly sins, the uh, 14 acts of mercy. Um, they go through the different parts of the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments, and there are a lot of questions about the definitions of particular sins. You know, so for example, you know, it's a sin to commit adultery. Is it adultery if you do this? Is it adultery if you do that? Is it forbidden for this thing, that thing? I just to thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you. I know yeah. we're, we're running out of time. Yeah. I, I agree, this was fascinating. Could you go back really quickly to the four variations, that early slide? Yeah. Uh, I just had a very quick question. You know, spending so much time, I wonder John might have had a similar reaction to the different Is spellings. No, where you, that you list all four, where you have Bue, you have, it was uh, one of this, the very, very one. early slides where you talked about the, these. This, yes. Yeah. Uh, in 16th century Spanish, Habwe, if they're trying to get that across, the Spaniards would put a Y there. That could sound, all three of those could sound exactly the same way and be written exactly the same way in the 16th century. So for the sound with a Y, you mean, or yeah, with a W? With a way. With a Yeah, with a U? so uh -huh. how do you know it's Habwe? Yes. Um, well... So I'm going to guess that in Tamuqua this was pronounced either habe or habwe, probably. But um, it never appears with a Y. Never with a Y, no. See, that's unusual. If you're learning yeah. that from the way it sounds, mm -hmm. the way they will always put a Y if you want that way sound. Hmm. Well, how about the, the W in bueno, for example? 
that's also common to see with a bueno y. and bono and yeah and sometimes in the same text. Mm -hmm. So it, w the thing that is a little mysterious about this is that, as we know, Spanish has a similar kind of alternation between O and UE in a lot of verbs. Um, it does not appear to me that there is any direct relation. I think it's just accidental that Tamuqua has this alternation, Span Spanish also. They're not exactly the same. So you see them in different contexts. Um, the uh, range of uh, words that are affected are not uh, quite the same. The range of consonant and vowels affected are not the same as well. Um, but it is a funny mystery that um, Spanish at the time had, say, bono, bueno sort of alternation. Tamuqua did also. But not in words that are borrowed from Spanish. In native Tamuqua words, there's this thing. It could be maybe in some way Maybe in some way the variable spelling of the Spanish people they were learning from affected the way they wrote their own language. So it could be an orthographic uh, artifice instead of a real uh, feature of the pronunciation. But even if it's only orthography, it is still different from text to text in a way that probably helps us identify different authors. So yeah. We'll do one final question. Sure. Hi, your 73,000 word database. Yeah. Are those words that you know the translation of now? And are you yourself able to look at a Timucuan text and, and decipher it, read it? Um, so I'll answer the second one first, which is um, for a, a new Timucua text I haven't looked at before, I can read about 85% of it usually. Um, for the 73,000 words in the corpus, I would say about probably in the range of 60 to 65,000 of those are uh, translated. And then that leaves us a residue of a couple thousand where there are mysteries. Basically, what you find in this kind of work is the more frequent a word is, the more you know what it means. If it only occurs once or twice in a text, it's often very mysterious exactly what is going on with this word. So, you know, I have my little, my, my list of my, you know, 20 most hated words of Tamuqua, the words that puzzle me the most. They're on my most wanted list. And when I can check one off and figure out what it means, that's a great victory for the day. The students that I'm working with have actually helped figure out some of the words that were on the last year's list of most mysterious Tamuqua words. OK, we're going to do one last question. And this okay. time, I mean it. <laughs> um, it's just. Uh, uh, I was reading Buckingham Smith, and uh, he related to, to the Calusas, and also James Moore uh, related to the uh, Cherokee. That uh, they felt that there, they theorized that there was a universal trade language used between um, all the Native American North American tribes, uh, um, based in Choctaw. So I'm wondering if that may have been um, when they communicated with the Spanish, would they be using maybe their universal language? Right, so that uh, trade language was called Mobilian jargon. Um, it's attested pretty much later in the historical record. I, I do actually know Choctaw, which is a great asset, and I can tell you that almost nothing here looks like Choctaw. <laughs> so because Mobilian is based on Choctaw, uh, I, I'm pretty sure there's no Mobilian in here. There are a handful of words that look similar between Tamuqua and Muscogean languages, but they are not frequent enough to suggest a trade language. They might suggest remote uh, historical connection. So for example, the word for dog in Tamuqua is Ifa. The word in Creek for dog is also Ifa. Uh, and it's Ofi in Choctaw. That might be a deep cognate between the languages at some point in time. <laughs>